Well folks, welcome to the Trespasser Let's Play. I imagine you've already seen the history of the game videos, so let's just dive right in. This is the first level, the beach. As you can see, it's a fairly linear level and is uh, easily the shortest level in the game. That said, let's begin. Welcome to Trespasser, it says. Here we are, standing on the beach where our plane crashed and mostly disintegrated, apparently. Hello? Marquez? Are you there? Estás ahí? He was shouting when we went down. He's trying to level us out. There you go. The plane went down and stuck us here on this mysterious island. For some reason, all that's left of this plane is the tail frame and two-thirds scale. We can pick up a rock and throw it into the water and see the nice pre-rendered ripple effect, one of the many tricks the developers used to reduce the system footprint for early computers. It's warm. I don't think I feel like swimming. Now here we hit a boundary. We are not allowed to go out there, okay. I'm afraid. I really don't feel like swimming. It's not like I can swim to America. Now some of you might recognize that voice. It's none other than star of stage and screen Mini Driver, most recently found on the FX television series The Riches. Now, there being nothing else to do here, we're gonna go ahead on and get moving with the level. You'll notice messages at the top of the screen from time to time. This level is a bit of a tutorial. It gives you the basics of game physics, how to manipulate your arm, use firearms, and then finally pits you against your first enemy. Here we enter the foundation graveyard. Piled all around this area are stacks of junk meant to show off the physics engine. No ace in the hole for these guys. They put it all out on the table right from the beginning, but it wasn't enough to save this game. Now you see there are piles of barrels and crates and just things sitting around for you to knock over for absolutely no other reason than just to prove that you are able to knock them over, which was a big deal at the time. Very impressive. Now the fragile crate there is the most common item in the entire game. There are scores of them in every level. I don't know what fragile things are in there, but whatever it is, each one of those crates is light enough that Anne is able to pick them up with one arm. Now we'll run up here and see what happens when you don't code friction into your physics engine. How about that? There's some pretty interesting things up here, so let's go check it out. Now, we hop up here, knock things over, and grab this. Now this is supposed to be an axe handle, but I think it's more of a busted hockey stick. Now you can see the lovely arm controls here, but uh, we're going to go ahead and put that away for now and continue. Alright, here's something we need to be careful of. The ATX mod adds hard and very hard difficulties to the game. Unfortunately, the way it does this is by putting a multiplier on hit points. On very hard, all enemies have four times normal health, while you have one-fourth normal health. Let's continue. The problem here is that the game forces you to take damage in some situations jumping down from ledges and such. Uh, this becomes a huge issue on very hard mode and I'm gonna have to deal with that at the proper time, I guess. Here the game is instructing us in basic use of your arm. Now hitting the fire button when you're holding a regular object causes you to swing it like a club. That might sound kind of useful, but melee weapons in this game, uh, except for one, are all effectively useless. Uh, I don't know if it's bugs or if they're actually meant to be that useless, uh, but when it comes down to fighting a dinosaur and all you have is something that you're swinging around, it's pretty much game over at that point. You may have noticed by now that Anne only has one arm. This is not because she actually has one arm, but it turned out to be a developer's issue early with the project. You can see all of the work that went into coding the right arm, uh, holding various keys to make it do things, but when they tried to set that up with a second arm, things just got ridiculous. I'm not sure. Uh, while this isn't really addressed, the sort of unwritten rule regarding the arm is that Anne broke her other arm, in the plane crash, and that's why you never see it. 
Now we're heading over to the jungle gym. It's an area that has a bunch of platforms at different levels and gaps and stairs and things. It's meant to get you familiar with the platforming aspect of the game. Normally this kind of area would be pretty harmless, but as you saw earlier, my hit points are really in no shape to be taking falling damage, so I'm going to have to be really, really careful here. Little training spots like this can be the death of me before I know it. Here are more examples of the physics engine in use. There's really no point to any of this. None of the puzzles require sophisticated use of the engine. Nearly every puzzle is a classic shoving a crate over so you can climb on it, actually. Close. So, we climb up here and we get our first quote from John Hammond. You'll remember him as the friendly old guy with the white beard in the movies. We're going to be hearing a lot from old John in this game. The southern beach looked out over Tractor's Ocean, down past Peru all the way to Antarctica. Lovely view from up here. We're going to continue now. Ow! Whoops, nearly killed myself there. Let's be more careful. It is beautiful here. Must be one of the offshore islands. Cocos. One of the sinking Muertes, maybe. Here we have a big old gate. The only way to open this gate is to body check it. So, here we go. Here we have a shooting gallery. This lets us figure out how Eight guns left. work in Trespasser before we meet an enemy. Heavier than I thought. Seven. Keep it steady. There are no ammo pickups in this game. Once your gun Six. shoots dry, it's useless. Now here's something the game is infamous for. The arm. Holding shift or control lets you move the arm on X and Y axes. Why this is in the game is anyone's guess. You see that you can move your arm into impossible positions. Now this was supposed to let you line up the sights on the weapons, but when you pick up a weapon, the sights are already lined up. Now, in most games, you'd need to use a grenade or something to kill yourself, but Trespasser allows good old-fashioned execution-style suicide. Eight left. So that's what that feels like. Something Trespasser did very well was its sound design. If you listen Six carefully left. to repetitive sounds like gunshots and footsteps, you'll notice they sound a little bit different each time. Trespasser was one of the first games to use sound randomizer software to keep things interesting. Anyway, you see how the guns work here. The shotgun Looks is damn like useful, so I'm going to hang on to it for now. Why did that happen? That was all the pieces of a chair, just sitting there, stacked perfectly but unattached. Knocking them apart shows off the physics engine again, but for no good reason. Trespasser gives you a lot of rock-throwing physics puzzles for some reason, but they can always be solved with a gun instead. It's amazing how difficult it is to chuck rocks at things when you don't have crosshairs. Six rounds. Five. And here Anne strong arms the box, sticks it over here, we climb up on the thing, over the fence, and here we go. Maybe, maybe if there's a phone line or a radio. Now, what you might be thinking is that we can go all Babe Ruth on the dinosaurs now, but forget it. Melee damage is done in this game based on the mass of the object used. I don't know if the developers forgot to add mass to the bat or what, but it almost never does damage, so we're not going to be using this. You can see the trees and undergrowth here bear a strong resemblance to the landscapes in Far Cry. Trespasser was ahead of the curve in a lot of respects. It's just a shame that they weren't able to pull this off in such a way that it didn't cause people's computers to go into epileptic shock. Engine. Some kind of... Wait. International Genetic Technologies. That was the company from the dinosaur trial. After the trial, that old guy, John Hammond, wrote a book. He, he said it was somewhere in Central America. My name is John Parker Hammond. I was born on March 14, 1928. Oh, no. Oh, God. The 
This is Site B. This is John Hammond's Lost World. The female voice you hear is Anne, the player character. Her lines are spoken out loud to no one in particular since she's alone on the island. John Hammond's lines are from his memoir written after the events in Jurassic Park and the Lost World. Anne has read the book and is hearing Hammond from her memory. The game takes place one year after Lost World. Now we're going to trek on down to a little secret area here. The game is trying to teach the player to get used to walking off the beaten path. Here we can take advantage of the no friction issue again to get arguably one of the best weapons in the game, the hunting rifle. Very high damage and the longest ranged weapon in the game. Not that it shoots any farther than the other weapons, but the sights are lined up just right so that you can shoot moderately far away enemies, which is more than you can say for most of the other guns. Pretty spiffy. Around 10. This is such a great rifle, but the reload time on it is terrible. If you get into a close quarters fight with this thing, you're dead. There must have been something in the memoir. A Nobel Prize or a financial empire wait somewhere in a darkened room, in a dirty, derelict building, somewhere in the Pacific. Again, with Five the crate puzzles. They do get their money's worth out of those crates. Ten shots. Now something I've learned is that whenever you're manipulating things in the world, you really don't want to have a weapon in your hand. At best, if you're trying to move something around, you'll drop your weapon and you gotta use your weird old noodle arm to reach down and pick it back up. At worst, your hand will clip through an item, the thing that you're holding is gonna fly Ten off shot. into the stratosphere and the whole game's gonna crash. Oh, man. He really did it. Brachiosaur, oldest of our recreations by 50 million years. The only true Jurassic native. Now, it's a little hard to tell, but it is really hard to aim with those Brachiosaurs stomping around. They shake the screen and my arm all over the place. Now, supposedly the Brachiosaurs can attack, but I've never seen it. They just walk around and do their thing. In the couple of levels that have these guys, it really seems like they're just there for show. They don't do anything or interact with anything. They just kind of chill out. That's it. Here we go again. They want me to throw a rock up here, but I'm just going to do the easy thing instead. You know, this road's in pretty good shape, all things considered. You know, being up on a mountain in the middle of a tropical jungle and all. You can see that this was a very pretty game in its day. These big outdoor environments were the first of their kind. I knew all along this was a stupid idea. I'm probably out drinking right now. And? And who? Now, I need to be careful. Coming up here is our first enemy, and he spawns in odd spots sometimes. Keep a weather eye out. He's around here somewhere. Eight left. Meet our first and most common enemy, the Velociraptor. This guy is small and deadly. He can outrun you no problem, but he charges in a straight line every time, making him pretty easy to avoid. They jump like mad, so watch out. Well, that was dangerous. Let's continue. The technology, the real trick of it, is still in there. In a darkened room in an empty building with a dirty floor. It waits. The flashpoint. 
the origin of Jurassic Park. Eight shots. A forest this wild, this unknown, has not been seen by any human since the great hunters of the early Pliocene. That cluster of buildings down there is where this level ends. The graphics draw distance is pretty impressive for 1998. That's got to be around a quarter of a mile away. And here's another. Let's look at how effective the shotgun is against Three these guys. Left. Hooray for Earth. Now, we're getting to the end of the level. Velociraptor, a small thelopod native to China and Mongolia. Pack hunter, quite vicious and quite intelligent. This was the place. This used to be just an urban myth. Right here is the monorail station. We'll be seeing quite a few of these in the next level. Now we come over here, head up the stairs, check out all the junk they've got sitting around up there, and we are just about done. Welcome to the city of tomorrow. Welcome to Site B, an InGen research facility. For centuries, mankind has wondered about the dinosaurs, the largest land animals ever to have lived. Now, thanks to Breakthrough Technologies. And that's the end of that. Now, if I can just get this note to come back. Ah, there we go. Opens March 15th, 1990. Now remember that despite the movie coming out in 1993, Jurassic Park took place in 1987. Three years was pretty reasonable to get all these monorail things done. And so we walk along the monorail track here, make one last jump, and that is the end. Tune in next time, folks, for Level 2, The Jungle Road. Thanks for listening.